Um, we feel very fortunate to be among colleagues and experts who have been exploring this kind of machine learning procedures and methods. Um, for example, yesterday we uh, listened to a panel that examines what counts as nature in the Ottoman travel literature, and today we learned what luxury could encompass and means in the early modern European literatures, and of course, the NER in ancient Greek. Um, um, I learned a lot from these colleagues, but today, unlike these colleagues, we are not going to present a specific method. We like to offer a framework of what we are doing. And like these colleagues, I like to uh, uh, explore and look and discover a lot of uh, terms in the large corpus on the issues related to food. For this kind of a project, there's always a challenge for humanists. Um, as we have been discussing, as we have been listening, uh, uh, a lot of humanists do not have that kind of access to this kind of machine learning pr uh, platforms, and for those of us who have access to this kind of machine learning pr platforms, we usually uh, uh, need to work across the borders to incorporate the programming skills as well as the historical inquiries to look into the corpus. For my project here, for our project here, we like to um, uh, deploy or include uh, uh, all kinds of methods in our framework to look into uh, uh, a huge, a fairly large corpus of classical Chinese texts. We're talking about about 200 million words. We want to do this by discovering, by using, by using all kinds of methods we have learned here and we want to discover more to put on our supercomputing platform and to show and to figure out and to explore all kinds of a semantic context of the sentences that might touch the issues of food. And uh, this approach or this framework would allow us to look into something that we don't know. What counts as food in the early modern world? What counts as, you know, for example, food is essential for human survival, right? So in the 16th century context, I discover a lot of peasants who suffer from the famines, and they were looking for a lot of things to eat, and they found some white clay, tastes like bread, and they ate it, a lot of it, and died. So if we look at that context, do we count that kind of white clay as food? So it is this kind of semantic context we need to look for a variety of dis different discoveries, and that requires a lot of computing power and a very flexible platforms. And I'm going to let Jeff tell you what kind of platforms we have. Thank you, Dr. Hugh. Um, yeah, so 200 million words is a pretty daunting number. Um, and, uh, but it's not an unusual scale for people in other disciplines, science uh, and engineering disciplines. And, and those people some years ago, led by Tom DeFonte and Larry Smart at UC San Diego, uh, recognized a lack even in that community of uh, powerful computing platforms based on GPUs. Uh, there was a gap between uh, what you might purchase for home use or use on the desktop or in a lab um, and what the cloud service providers were offering. Um, and, uh, in that gap uh, was machine learning. Uh, and it turns out that you do not need high-end GPUs to do machine learning. Um, you need a 32-bit floating point GPU. And in, and in fact, that uh, round off that is imposed by that lack of 64 floating bits um, is helpful in some machine learning workflows. So they petitioned the National Science Foundation under uh, um, a, a computer information um, program called SIZE to build Nautilus. And Nautilus is a free computational platform 
You don't hear that very often. Um, it's hyper-converged, and we'll talk about what that means. Um, and it's also distributed. Uh, it's multi-institutional, um, and we serve people across all of these very large domains. Um, it is a, a combination of many CPUs, many GPUs, very large storage, and even field gate programmable arrays, which are um, sort of this hybrid mix between software and hardware that can do extraordinary things. Um, it also runs on Kubernetes, and whether you know it or not, w the world runs on Kubernetes. When you open up a Google web search, you're not actually attaching yourself to a Google, Google server. What you're doing is you're spawning your own personal version of the Google search engine running in a container. Um, as I said, the Nautilus is, Nautilus is funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation, but more than 70% of the hardware in Nautilus has actually been contributed by um, its partner institutions. Many people find it so useful that they want to contribute, and, and so Tom DeFonte calls that potluck computing or bring-a-plate computing. Um, and through this bring-a-plate computing, the initial investment of just under a million dollars by the National Science Foundation has grown into this uh, computing infrastructure with global span. Now, I don't expect you to be able to see the, uh, the actual locations of these, but generally, if you look in the upper left, uh, you see a small box for Europe. We could do better there. Um, we also have a presence in Asia and Oceania, um, but most of the infrastructure is in the United States. Uh, the good news for, for this international crowd is all you really need is a, a decent uh, connection like you might have on your cell phone or a laptop to run on Nautilus. You don't need uh, very large uh, network infrastructure. So Nautilus is big. Um, this is a screen grab from yesterday. Um, there are 1,228 installed GPUs. And right now, there's someone in a namespace using 557 of them simultaneously. And we still have 682 left to spare. So um, there's also almost 20,000 CPU cores. Now, um, a lot of machine learning um, techniques run very well on GPUs. They're very fast. They're very performant. But they will also run on CPUs. So if you don't have a particular timetable, you it's months before your paper has to be published. You may choose to run your things on these very, very abundant CPUs. And of course, um, we can deal with very large data sets. Uh, so 200 million words is, is daunting, yes, but it easily fits within the 95 terabytes of very high performance spinning disks that are attached to Nautilus. And unlike um, maybe some traditional computing systems, Nautilus actually moves the computation to the data. So if your data are re resident, um, let's say, here in Europe, you probably are going to do your computing close by. If, however, the resources that you want are distant, uh, the system will automatically replicate your data to the remote location and perform the com computation there. All of that is managed by the system. The user is, it's, it, it's transparent to the user. Um, but the platform isn't enough. Um, for this kind of project, we really need to establish some kinds of collaboration tools because we expect an international um, consortia to work on this very large uh, uh, problem. Um, so as I mentioned, the software is running in containers. Um, and, and these containers are m little mini computers. And each one is built from scratch. Um, they offer some advantages that we want to um, take a look at in that they are scalable. We can run many of them simultaneously, so we can break up very large problems into smaller bits. Um, they allow for increased resource uh, utilization. When your container is done, it, re it releases the computational resources it was running on, and then someone else can use it. And as I said, it's very portable. It can move to, to your data or, or, or anywhere it needs to go in order to work. Um, 
that's sort of behind the scenes. In, in f one of the tools that we intend to employ in front of the scenes is a Jupyter Notebook. Now, how many people in the audience have used Jupyter Notebooks or know what Jupyter Notebooks are? So they're ubiquitous. So we all know how to work with them and share them, and we plan to leverage this kind of technology for this project. One of the particular challenges um, when using uh, Jupyter Notebooks is building the right kind of uh, software stack. And if you've ever gotten sort of stuck and getting these weird cryptic errors, many times it's because the software you're trying to run doesn't match uh, the operating system and the kernel and the packages that you've installed. So as we build these workflows, we may find it beneficial to actually stand up a, a Jupyter Hub for a, a given approach. And we may have different Jupyter Hubs for different approaches. And at the end of this process, we expect that we'll have sort of this model garden where you can go and you can choose your approach, you can load your data, and you can launch a Jupyter Notebook in one of these hubs, and it's pre-configured so you don't really have to worry about those particular details. You may not even need a computer scientist. I know that's a shock. Um, and of course, we want um, all of our code to be findable, accessible, interoperable, um, and repeatable. Uh, so we intend to use best practice in, in engineering and computer science in that we will uh, establish code repositories that stand behind these Jupyter Notebooks um, and really enable the community of practice to emerge around using these large language models. Um, one particular challenge that we encountered as we were sort of discussing this project was um, the idea of sharing data in a way that protected intellectual property rights, but also sort of reduce the administrative burden in order for us to actually run some of these workflows. And in this particular case, um, the data grantors weren't really willing to just make a copy of the data for us because they'd worked really, really hard on developing it. But we were able to come to an agreement that they would give us a subset of the data. And it's from that subset that we will um, develop our approaches, um, structure you know, our, our ontology, and then run some of these initial tests. And then through those collaborative methods in software and, and notebooks, we will give them the approach, and they will run it, and then report the results back to us. So it sort of solves the problem we, we expect in, in these data sharing issues. Now, you may be asking yourself, um, you know, when it came up in the last session uh, about these large language models and sort of the unknown nature of, uh, of them. And as we've seen, large language models are, are exhibiting some emergent behaviors. And we don't have good explanations for what these emergent behaviors, why they are. Um, but what we're seeing is as the models scale up, um, their ability to do things that were otherwise impossible seems to be improving. So for example, um, once you get past about 10 to the 23rd um, uh, uh, cycles or flops or, or um, epochs, um, something like chain of thought reasoning gets a lot more uh, performant in these very large language models. And chain of thought reasoning is a kind of prompt engineering that we expect to leverage. Um, we can't likely fine tune these models in the way that you might do for a model that you fully control or a large or a smaller model. But uh, prompt engineering is showing some abilities to refine or retrain these large language models while retaining uh, some of these emergent behaviors. Um, and so uh, we, we expect to use a mixed methodology. So the first thing that we want, and the first thing that we want to do is just the traditional uh, scholarly work, right? Um, small data set, close reading, limited inquiry, but we, we expect that this will be high, will produce very high quality results. Um, our hybrid approach is to take those results and use them to prompt engineer chain of thought, reason, or other prompt engineering techniques against these very large language models. Uh, we'll have a very large data set instead of a limited data set. Um, the, we will reproduce the same inquiries that we did in the traditional approach. Um, and then we'll use that high quality response as a way to calibrate the model. 
So it turns out that if you give a model a question and provide the answer, give the model a question and provide the answer, um, the model learns. That's an example of this emergent behavior. Um, and then once we have some sort of, uh, we can also report on the quality of these, of these responses. We can actually get the model to tell us if it thinks that it's right or not, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, simultaneous to all that, we want to do some things called zero shot, right? Without training the model, we're just going to ask it these questions. What was the importance of, you know, ginseng in early classical Chinese texts, and how does it relate to, let's say, um, local economies? Um, and we expect that these zero shot questions will come up with wrong answers and what we call in machine learning hallucinations. Uh, and they'll be confidently wrong. Um, but because we're partnering with the historians who can say, well, that's not true, and this is why that's not true, um, at the end of this process, we will have a comparison between the, the classical approach, the refined approach, and, and then this unrefined approach. And it's this hybrid um, approach to uh, hermeneutics that we expect to provide some insight into whether or not these models are useful in these historical inquiries. Um, what's our time, Nick? Five minutes, so oh, that's perfect. So um, the deployment of these AI and LLMs in the context of humanities requires us to close these gaps in data, algorithms, models, and platforms. And while we don't have a complete answer of how we might do that um, in, this, in this process, we're really building a framework uh, um, uh, to, to, try to, to try to narrow those gaps. Um, and as part of that, these multi-institutional partnerships, they require open platforms, standards of practice, and, and data access schemes. And we want to be able to share uh, methodology, not necessarily data. I want to give you access to the Nautilus cluster, but not really tell you how you have to use it. Um, and we're, we're hopeful that these chain of thought reasoning, these other prompt engineering techniques, which are sort of state of the art now and these very large language models, um, will, will, will make it so that we do not have to build our own language models. We can repurpose and reuse these large language models. And that's both attractive and I think kind of untested. Um, and then I think we're sort of uniquely positioned at UC Santa Cruz uh, to, to work on some of these issues. And that's why I jumped in. Um, I could have just given uh, Dr. Hu uh, an account and said, good luck. Um, but I think there's a lot of promise here to provide some equity to humanists such as yourselves um, to access these platforms. Yeah, Nautilus is an NSF funded project and primarily used by data scientists, astronomers, marine biologists. I'm, for now, I'm the only token humanist who has a seat in the table. And we are here not bragging about Nautilus, but inviting all of you to, to join us, to collaborate with us, to share methodology. And uh, UCSC will sign uh, un, a memorandum of understanding to respect your, your work, your copyright. And uh, I hope this kind of a collaboration will flourish. Thank you.